So, you want to become a quant. Maybe you're drawn to the prestige, the maths, or let's be real, the money. You picture yourself writing some cutting edge algorithms, beating the market, and collecting massive bonuses. And yeah, of course, that is the reality. That can actually happen. But what no one tells you is how much of your job is writing, debugging and optimizing code, for example. Not solving fancy equations all day. In fact, on some days, the maths you loved in university barely even shows up. I remember six months ago when I got my first quant job, I was expecting to spend my days diving very deep into stochastic calculus, deriving complex models and coming up with some innovative trading strategies. Instead, I quickly realized that about 80% of my time was spent billing with code, writing it, debugging it, and optimizing it for speed. Of course, the math is there, but it's often in the background supporting everything else. If your code is slow or inefficient, the best mathematical model in the whole world will not help you. And if your model has a subtle bug, you won't even know why it's losing money until it's way too late. This is the part that most people do not talk about. So in this video, I want to share everything I wish I knew before starting out, what the job actually involves, what I got right, what I got completely wrong, and what you should prepare yourself if you want to get into the industry. Before we dive into the details of the video, I want to thank today's sponsor, which is none other than Brilliant. If you're watching this, chances are that you either want to become a quant or you just love maths, coding and problem solving. And that's exactly where Brilliant can help you. Their courses cover everything from probability and machine learning to statistics and finance, but in a way that's interactive and actually fun. So you're not just memorizing formulas like in school, you're actually understanding them. They break down complex topics into interactive bite-sized pieces and lessons that actually make sense. When I was learning about probability data science and neural networks, I found Brilliant's approach super helpful. Instead of just throwing formulas at you, they actually guide you through real-world applications. So you're not just memorizing equations, you're building intuition behind them. I've actually used their courses on linear algebra and statistics, which trust me, are essential if you're thinking about getting into quant finance. And if you're preparing for a quant interview, their problem solving courses are great for sharpening your logical and mathematical thinking, because in this field, it's not just about knowing the maths, it's about applying it efficiently. Textbooks don't always make it easy, as you might already know. So I definitely would encourage you to give Brilliant a try and sharpen your coding, maths, and data science skills. Whether you're a student or professional or just someone who absolutely loves learning, Brilliant is an amazing resource. Check out the link in the description to get a free trial and 20% off your first premium subscription. Thank you so much, Brilliant, for sponsoring today's video and let's get into the things I wish I knew before starting my career as a quant developer. At university, I definitely spent so much time proving theorems and working with abstract mathematical concepts. It felt like maths for the sake of maths, if that makes any sense. But in quant finance, the focus completely shifts. It's all about practicality. You don't get any bonus points or marks for elegance. All that matters is whether your model works in real life conditions. I had this moment early on in my job when I needed to implement a pricing model for options. In theory, I knew everything about the Black-Scholes equation. I could derive it from scratch. I was actually tested on it at Oxford. I understood all the assumptions behind it and everything. But when I had to actually code it in Python, suddenly everything felt like 10 times harder. The equation itself was just a very, very small part of the bigger problem. The real challenges were to only name a few. One, handling real world data. Markets do not behave at all like nice theoretical models. You have to deal with messy, incomplete and constantly changing data. And something I actually never thought about beforehand is where you get this data from. That in itself is a really big challenge. And finding that one data set that you can squeeze in so you can bring in, you know, untouched alpha is really, really hard. And often you need to think about it for a very long time. Two, ensuring numerical stability. Small floating point errors can completely throw off your calculations and you need to catch them. There can be randomness in your algorithms, which you need to handle in a way that doesn't make your trades be completely different in between different runs of your algorithm. And lastly, optimizing performance. If your model takes 10 seconds to run per asset, that's way too slow. You need to optimize it to milliseconds, otherwise your so-called optimal number of loss you want to trade is not at all optimal anymore. 
So yeah, university math gives you the foundation, but you need to unlearn sort of the idea that equations exist in some perfect, untouched control world. In finance, they're just one part of a much bigger system that includes code, data, and real world constraints. One of the biggest shocks to me was as well how much I rely on probability and statistics every single day. At university, I treat probability as just another subject. Don't get me wrong, it was always a really exciting module, but I would have never guessed how big of a role it would play in our everyday jobs rather than just in the preparation for interview questions. So yeah, as a quant, even in your day-to-day -day life, everything revolves around probabilities and distributions and how to use them for machine learning models. Yeah, markets are noisy there is no such thing as a perfect signal. You're always dealing with uncertainty, with randomness and with incomplete data. If you don't have a strong grasp of probability theory, you won't just struggle, you'll make really bad trading decisions. Some real world applications of probability would include risk modeling. So every position we take has a probability of loss. How do we quantify it? Statistical arbitrage, we sort of ask the question, is this pattern a real trading opportunity or is it just random noise? And Monte Carlo simulations, so what happens if you simulate this strategy 10,000 times, 100,000 times, and how often does it fail? So if I could go back and relearn one thing before I became a quant, maybe in the summer before starting out, I spent way more time studying probability and statistics in more depth, but especially within the financial context, because it is the foundation of everything we do. And I would have wanted to have like even a more solid foundation that I had at university. When I first started, I thought my job would be about solving complex equations all day. Instead, I quickly realized that the real bottleneck in quant finance is not the maths, it's the code. You can have the most sophisticated model in the world, but if it's slow or it's buggy, it's absolutely useless. If you're thinking of becoming a quant, you need to get to love debugging. And I know how awkward that sounds, but I'm really not exaggerating when I say that half my time is spent fixing things that don't work as expected. Bugs in finance aren't just annoying, they can be catastrophic. If your model has a solid bug, it could lose millions before anyone even notices it. So for example, some real debugging nightmares that I've dealt with are a tiny floating point procedure error causing a trade to execute at the wrong price, a loop that should have been vectorized slowing the entire system down by a high margin, even if it was just a for loop, a missing edge case in a risk model leading to incorrect loss predictions. And the worst part, debugging in finance is harder because markets are always changing. So a model that worked yesterday might fail today and you need to figure out why is today a lot more special than yesterday? Why is it failing today? Optimization is one of the most underrated skills in the job. It's not enough to write code that works, it needs to run fast. In finance, milliseconds do actually matter. So if your strategy takes too long to execute, someone else will beat you to the trade. Some common optimizations that you might need to make would be to vectorize Python code, as I mentioned before, instead of using slow loops, but to use compiled languages like C++ for performance critical functions, or to paralyze some computations to take advantage of multiple cores. I once spent an entire week trying to optimize a single function for pricing options. At first, it took two seconds per contract, which was too slow for trading. And after optimization, I got it down to like 0 0.005 seconds per contract. And that's pretty much the difference between a profitable strategy and one that's completely unusable. When I first started, I thought as long as my code worked, that was enough. Well, wrong. Writing messy, unstructured code will become your number one enemy. It can come back to bite you quite a bit, especially when you have to debug something that you wrote months ago and it just looks like complete hieroglyphics. Good code is definitely not just about writing it. It's about making sure future you or your teammates can understand it and modify it quickly. If you don't follow a proper structure, you'll end up in a tangled mess that no one really wants to touch. Here's what I wish I focused on earlier code modularization. Don't write one massive script, break things down into functions and classes. It makes debugging a hundred times easier. 
version control. Do learn how to use Git properly, not just as a save button, but to actually track changes and work in different branches. Naming conventions, name variables logically, not X equals some calculation of Y, but option price equals calculate price of strike. Trust me, it does save time, it does save you. Another super big one is logging and error handling. Add logs, please. If there is some one thing that you learned from this video, it is to add logs so that when something breaks, which trust me, it will, your code is not bulletproof at all, you know why without spending hours just printing random variables. And of course, the good old documentation. Future you will not remember what the alpha underscore adjustment function was supposed to do. So just write a tiny short doc string. A well-structured code base is the difference between spending 10 minutes fixing a bug and spending 10 hours trying to understand your own logic from 10 months ago. It cannot be a video about quant finance without talking about machine learning. That is literally the cool new kid on the block in finance. Everybody wants to use it, but here's the truth. It's definitely not a magic bullet. Some areas where ML actually shines in quant finance, I would say, are portfolio optimization. So finding the best allocation of assets under some risk constraints, market making for sure, identifying inefficiencies and reacting faster than your competition. Then it would be risk modeling. So predicting some tail events and anomalies in market behavior and signal processing, of course. So extracting meaningful trading signals from some noisy data. But the thing is, the biggest challenge isn't building a machine learning model. It's making sure that your model doesn't get fooled by noise. It doesn't overfit, as we call it. Markets are full of some random fluctuations. And just because a neural network finds a pattern, it doesn't mean that it's actually predictive. I definitely haven't used machine learning as much as I would have liked in my job. I studied it so much in university, going very, very deep into the theory of deep learning and proving very, very exciting theorems, very innovative and new theorems, but I'm still to be using this knowledge at my day-to-day -day job. Who knows, maybe it's coming up or maybe it's just not fast enough to work in our setting. Yeah, the harsh reality is if you think this is a normal corporate job where you just log in at 9 a.m., you take a really long lunch and you leave at 5 p.m., well, that's not really how it is. Quant jobs are intense. That's not just a myth. How long you work, of course, depends on your team, your company, and the specific strategy that you're working on. But for many quants, that traditional 40-hour work week is not really in the cards. And if something breaks, especially if it's trading related, you're staying in until that's fixed. Basically, market hours also dictate pretty much everything. Um, especially if you're working at the trading desk, you're expected to be at your desk before markets open and often stay late to monitor your positions. Even in non-trading roles, if a model needs tweaking, it needs to be updated, or there is a bug that's causing issues in production, you don't just walk away at 6 p.m. You stay until that's fixed. There were a few, to be fair, quite rare, which I'm really, really lucky about, occasions when I had to stay in until like half seven to fix small things that were impacting a model. But I would say that the norm for me personally is to work from nine to six. So it's actually quite good compared to what I've heard from other people at different companies. Quant finance is high pressure because every decision can impact real money. Unlike in academia, where a wrong answer means losing a few marks on an exam, here a bad model or a coding bug can actually cost you millions. It's the kind of pressure that might not be for everyone. One of the most stressful moments that I've had since joining was when I pushed an update to a model and the next morning something was really off in the results. So I had to scramble quite a bit for quite a few hours to figure out whether it was a mistake in my code, a data issue or just something wrong with the strategy in itself. So until I figured out, every second felt like sort of a countdown to disaster. So it's definitely a bit of a life or death situation in my head, even if it's obviously not like we're saving lives or anything, but it still can feel like it. Deadlines are also quite relentless. You don't always get the luxury of saying, I need more time to refine this model. Sometimes a model just needs to be ready by market open, no matter what. That means that you need to make it work, even if it's not 
perfect. Let's be honest, work-life balance in quant finance is not great. You have to be really disciplined about setting your boundaries because the job will take as much time as you're willing to give to it. Some firms are definitely worse than others. In certain high-frequency trading firms, the expectation is that work is your actual life. You're always on call, you're expected to answer messages at pretty much any time. But in other firms, especially in asset management, things can be a bit more relaxed. But you still have some periods in the year of intense work, especially when new strategies or new models are being deployed. One thing that's definitely helped me in these past six months is learning when to switch off. There will always be one more bug to fix, one more optimization to make, one more thing to tweak, one more loop that you can vectorize, but you have to decide where you draw the line. Otherwise, you will burn out and it's just not worth it. That being said, if you want to be a good quant, but also have life outside of work, it's definitely possible, but it does take a bit of effort to establish some things. You have to be smart about time management, prioritization, and setting expectations with your team. I think I mostly have this thing figured out now after six months at my job, but at first it definitely came as a shock. After being in university for so long where I could work whenever I wanted and from wherever I wanted really. I do almost always switch out very soon after 6 p.m. but by the time I am done with my workouts after work at the gym and come back home for the night it's often past 9 p.m. already. So I need to be quite efficient in how I spend my evenings, how I organize all of my chores. I do wish though that I could tell myself from six months ago that it does get easier. There of course will be times when I'm super stressed and I cannot get detached at all from work problems, but they are definitely not happening all the time. And there is nothing a quick weekend trip to anywhere in the world cannot fix. I'm telling you. So will I do it all over again? Honestly, yes but I'd go into it way more prepared. So if you want to become a quant, do focus on coding, learn probability inside and out, and prepare for a lot of debugging. Do let me know down in the comments what surprised you most about quant finance. And if you're already in the industry, what's one thing that you wish you knew before you started? Let's help out future quants. I do hope that you found this video helpful and enjoyable. If you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel for more maths and quant and studying and some university content sprinkled here and there. And if you want to see more of me, you've got my Instagram down in the description below. Thanks again so, so much for watching and I really, really hope to catch you in the next one. I'm sick of daydreaming I just want the feeling of you in my bed I'm down at this waistline Right below your waistline Want you by my head